Hello, and welcome to yeah. Greet the Week. This program is dedicated to living in the now, and in the process of doing that, to uh, express it with gratitude. And uh, to I was just speaking with uh, one of the people that has joined us now, and, and Alice and I were discussing how that we need to look at life with the tension. And I like to look at it with putting my palms together and my fingertips together and pressing them together and how much tension that puts on my shoulder. Whereas whenever I can release that tension, then uh, I can handle life situations a little better. So I am Mona Duncan and my address is monaduncan at gmail.com and it is spelled D-U-N-K-I-N. And I would appreciate comments. Uh, of course, you can always make comments with the screen share with the uh, chat room. But then if there's a subject that you'd like to have addressed in a future Monday afternoon session, why well, go ahead and give it to me. Today's topic is about overcoming obstacles. And so I'm going to share the screen. Share the screen on overcoming obstacles and put it in a slideshow so that you can see it up close. I appreciate a lot of regulars being here with us. And for those of you that miss Jerry, he is in Hawaii. So he'll be back with us next week. So looking at obstacles and we're going to look at removing life's roadblocks by processing the present in the moment. Uh, always looking at what's going on now and what, what information I have at this point in life and what information I may need to garner so that I can handle other issues in life a little more competently. So um, I have spent a lifetime of working with federal prisoners and also working with the at-risk community. And so uh, I like to look at going from adversity to advantage and looking at that roadblock. And I like to ask my audience, you know, how would you define a roadblock or what is it? What is an obstacle? And some of the responses I have gotten from the audience is that an obstacle is something that keeps you from shining. And I like that. So I put a little picture up here of, of, a, of a diamond. Now, you know, a diamond is a piece of coal that stuck with it when the pressure came. And it became coal because there was pressure that was transforming it into something else. But then that diamond became a diamond because of excess pressure. And it certainly handled it in a way that has become one of the most sought after and expensive gems there are. Another participant said that uh, obstacles are life lessons. And they certainly can become less of obstacles if we see that it's a lesson I haven't learned yet. Or there's something in there that I need to learn. Another audience participant said it's an obstacle or an obstruction. Well, I think of, and then I like to ask, and once those roadblocks have been encounters, how easily can you move past them? Or is it like Ann Landers said, the dear Abby of many years ago, or the dear Ann, resentment is letting someone you despise live rent-free in your head. And that can be a real obstacle. But if we're letting them live rent-free, Maybe it's time for us to uh, evict them, not necessarily from our life, but certainly from ruling our life. And I think of the uh, well-known 18th century writer, Thomas Aquinas, uh, that said, to know all is to forgive all. That if there's somehow we could really know intentions, perceptions, life obstacles, life blessings, we could be just readily forgive or readily move past without holding on. So uh, John Maxwell, so 
I moved back to an, Mona Duncan said this. This is the this is kind of one of my philosophies that I've come up with in life is that we are every one of us, we are formed in our mother's womb. Whether that was loving and kind or whether it was <sighs> not so loving and kind. But regardless, every one of us have come into being by past generations getting together and we were formed in our mother's womb and we become deformed by the wounds of this world, whether that's physical or emotional or mental or spiritual, we become deformed, we become hurt, we become wounded. And because we don't want to stay wounded, or hurt, we conform to the ways of others. We begin to look at other people that we either want to be like them in that we want to hurt people like they hurt us, or we want to be like them because they have a way that has, that has helped to soften us. But always, 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 I see that we are transformed through our words, through the words that we use, through the words that we think, through the words that we employ. So John Maxwell was talking about how people change and when they change. And from my point of view, he came up with three definitives that people change only when they hurt enough, they have to. And with the prison system and the at-risk community, a lot of the people that I work with are at the point that they have to change. Something's got to get. So people change only when they hurt enough, they have to. They learn enough, they're able to. And you experience enough that you want to. And so I'm here as a learner myself, because I want to keep learning and growing and overcoming, that I want to learn enough. And I'm also here to help give you information enough so that you can learn enough to be able to and to experience enough. Well, that lazy is crazy, crazy, crazy. But maybe, maybe, maybe if I try it, something might give. Experience enough that you want to. So uh, we learn through spaced repetition. I get confused here. Oh, there. Okay, sorry about that. We learn about life through spaced repetition. And we have talked about this before, but I'm just going to go through it rather quickly. That these continuous life factors are the genetics, our ancestors, the environment that we were reared in, that we continue to live in, work in, the outside influences, pleasure, pain. We also are influenced through nature nurture, the things that is a part of our appearance, what we look like, our temperaments that we have, our basic needs that are always there. They're not wants, they are needs that need to be fulfilled. And then the things that we learned through our nurture, both then that continues on, such as our attitudes, our behaviors, our values or our belief systems. And that always looking at the fact that it is through our mind or our intellect that we reason and consider and weigh and understand the issues of life. It is through our emotions that we feel the issues of life for whatever the range is, whatever the spectrum is, high, low, sorrow, shame. And that it is with our will that we decide the issues of life. Yes, I will do that. No, I will not do that. So, and also in that will, is it, are we willing things through innocence or are we willing things through ignorance that we think it would be okay, but we don't know, or maybe it's just our, our innocence. I know I had a lady tell me one day that 
she's had all these charges against her and everything. And she said, but I really didn't know that I was making a choice. Sometimes it may be, but anyway, which is it? And then also I like to look at, is it an antonym or are we looking at it through a synonym? For example, we are all one. We are all connected. And that, well, a, the word overcome. I like to use overcome a lot because to me, it is rising above. It is surmounting rather than being overcome. But you also can use overcome as being defeated. And so I want to overcome and to help others to learn to overcome situations that seem to be overcoming them. So some personal reflections. To excuse is an emotional decision. I mean, if someone, if there's some kind of an of a uh, resentment, some kind of an influence, and we have this em, we have this emotional feeling that comes, but whether or not we move past it or hold on to it and resent it and let it live rent free in our brain, is an emotional decision. But I also suggest that refusal to move past, to exclude, to forgive, to overcome is biological sabotage, meaning that it sets up in us to begin to destroy, to begin to sicken, to begin to, uh, have you ever said it makes me sick? Well, do you know if we hold on to it, it really can make us sick, mentally, emotionally, relationally. Another reflection is that the ordinary part of you accepts limitations and excuses but not that extraordinary part of you. Accept those excuses and limitations in yourself. I had someone say to me not too long ago, was getting really upset with mechanics and said, why did the person made the comment said, why do I let this upset me so much? Well, you know, that ordinary part of us will accept ourselves getting really frustrated and limited and getting excuses. But there's something inside of us that will not accept that because they know deep down inside, or if you don't know it yet, I'm really trusting you can get to the point where you do. Know that deep down inside, there's an extraordinary part of you that can overcome that, that can surmount. And then that forgiveness, moving past, overcoming, is more about you than it is the other person or the obstacle itself. So let's look at some practical points of overcoming. Something happened, whether it was real or imagined, and whatever it was, you continue to be resentful. Point number two, you admit to yourself that it continues to hurt, that it hinders you in some way, that it interferes with getting on with life, that it interferes with being at peace. You come to realize that the only person you can control or ever could control is you. And that you are powerless to control how another person thinks, feels, or acts. Now, if that is well known to you, you can kind of shake your head and understand. But if that seems like, oh, I don't know. I mean, I really can say things that we do can say and do things that influence others, but we really can't control them. The only thing is, is that maybe sometimes if we have been successful in that influence, we may inadvertently, incorrectly think we've controlled it. It's realizing that forgiveness or overcoming involves people, not objects or events. It's getting over moving past the fact that I offended or I was offended. It is moving past the fact that it involves people, that I slandered someone, that I, it involves people. 
whether it, the, the person is forgiving self, whether the forgiveness or the moving past is forgiving others. Life change is done by one person on walk. Our life change, it, it's in our hands. Change is an inside job. From our thoughts, our actions, our feelings, our emotions. But reconciliation requires two or more. Some more points. You acknowledge that you have choices and that you are responsible for your behaviors. For the ways you act, the ways you think, the ways you feel. Seven, you deliberately, on purpose, with full awareness, for your own sake, choose, make a choice, to release resentment. To release that anger, to release that hurt, to release that wound. Eight. You focus more on healing than you do on hurting. You focus more on healing yourself, getting well, feeling better, being happy, than you do focusing on how you are still hurting because it does take a while for those things to begin to um, recede. As I'm thinking about that, I'm thinking of something that was in my notes that I was going to mention. And it was, maybe I'll think of it later. You felt more than you do on her, and you also focus more on healing than on hurting someone else. And number nine, you recognize that you alone are responsible for how you continue to act, to feel, to engage. So um, in previous talks, I've, I've mentioned the shadow side, which was founded by or given that name by Carl Jung. And I put here the shadow side versus creativity because Dr. William Glasser the founder of reality therapy and choice theory looks at how our creativity of our ability to see things differently and to redo redo things is is a wonderful thing and sometimes we can use that creativity for the negative as opposed to using creativity for the positive but here is a definition that Carl Jung gave to what he meant by the shadow side if the repressed tendencies, the shadow, as I call them, were, in, were obviously evil, there would be no problem whatever. Because, you know, we the people could issue laws to overcome that and just imprison everyone that was evil. But the shadow is merely somewhat inferior. It is primitive, unadapted, and awkward, not wholly bad. It even contains childish or primitive qualities which would, in a way, vitalize and embellish human existence. But convention forbids it. Once we become more intellectual, we forbid that childishness. But you know, if we can retain that childlikeness without being childish, then we can really be whole and complete and mature. Because with that creativity, Dr. Glasser said that without having fun, we don't learn. But as we learn in a way that is fun. Anyway, uh, Carl Jung goes on to say that one does not become enlightened by imagining figures of light, but by making the darkness conscious. So I came up with uh, just a little chart here on what is an awakened conscience and what is a darkened conscience? And I'm just going through this without a lot of explanation. Awakened, beginning to wake up, you know, getting the fog out of your eyes when you wake up in the morning, seeks unity and understanding. Whereas staying 
darkened and not knowing divides and separates and isolates. Maybe why we become offended. So awakened comes to a place of knowing where whether I know whether I'm correct or incorrect, it just comes to that place of knowing. Whereas that darkened conscience is an ongoing state of unawareness and it becomes, a, well, what's wrong with it? Awakened sees circumstances as life lessons. Whereas unawakened or darkened is, becomes enmeshed in the circumstances, trying to dig into and find out and why this and why that. Awakened conscience nests that it is what it is. It, it is. The darkened conscience takes it personally. It's that it's all about it's, it's all about me. And it is about us, but it's not all about us. The awakened conscience sees purpose beyond the pain, beyond the difficulty. Whereas the darkened conscience fails to find purpose in pain. The awakened conscience is mentally quiet rather than being on that uh, wheel of the, the rodent. <laughs> Whereas the darkened conscious is all frightened, worried, anxious, and is on that hamster wheel. An awakened conscience begins to allow organic conclusions seeing how it can work itself out, what I can do, what I can't do. Whereas that darkened conscience that feeds on drama and loves gossip, wants more of the, the down and dirty. An awakened conscience connects to the present moment, realizes that overcoming, that handling this is, is working with it now. Whereas the darkened conscience is working on the past keeping self there, keeping others there, you always this, you never that. An awakened conscious is accepting what is, whereas the darkened distorts and sees self as not being worth anything. So in awakening my own personal conscience, I did and continue to ask myself, what if I could? What if I, what if I didn't think that I knew what someone else was thinking? What if I didn't think I knew another person's motives? What if I didn't spend one, what if I could spend one hour not resisting or not pushing back? And then I began to expand it to what if I could spend a whole day? What if I could spend one hour not resenting rather than holding on to it and feeling that pain and nursing it? And cursing it and rehearsing it. What if I could let it go for an hour? What about for a day? What if I spent one day listening instead of reacting? What if I spent one day hearing instead of arguing? What if I spent one day allowing grace to fill my life? I want to be gracious. And to allow that grace to just fill my life. Well, maybe, you know, spend some time with these what if thoughts. Until you begin to turn around a pattern of traits or behaviors that at one time were, you know, kind of crimping as opposed to releasing. So here's a poem that was written by Larry Colton. She gave me permission to share this. And Lyric writes, Sometimes I feel like a complete stranger in my own skin. Awkward and self-conscious, like the first day of school. Startled by my own reflection, I stop and stare. Who is this woman? The sinner. Where has she been? What has she done? I see the wear and tear of my years and it breaks my heart to realize that I can never regain access to a single moment that has passed. Even more so that I have so little to show for my battles, save broken hearts and burned bridges. My past plays out like the path left in the wake of the Texas Twister. Little worth, more than pain and vast destruction. 
Yet out of that rubble will I rise like the proverbial phoenix. It's so cliche. But every generation blames the one before. Sure, let's pass the buck. But does that make you your child's scapegoat? Thus far, the only praiseworthy accomplishment of my adult life is the birth of an amazing human being. Yet it shames me to hear mom uttered in my direction because I have far from earned that title. Make no mistake, successful sobriety is a predominantly selfish undertaking. However, a large portion of my motivation comes from my consuming dream of the future. A future where my child remembers more, remembers the rise after the fall. Well, what about you? What about you? Think you can do it? Think you can change? Make no mistake, overcoming, surmounting, rising above is a predominantly selfish endeavor that it becomes selfless in the process. And letting the motivation being a continuing dream of a future that is much more pleasant. A future where not only others, but more importantly, you remember the rise after the fall. Thank you for being here. Go in peace.